A Gathering of Days, A New England's Girl's Journey, um, journal that is, 1830 to 1832, a novel by Joan W. Bloss. Chapter 7, Monday, January 24th, 1831. You would never think how many people live in our state of New Hampshire. 269,533. Teacher Holt this morning showed us the Columbian Sentinel. For January the 8th, his friend, a Mr. Garrison, had sent it on from Boston. Other true facts concerning our state. Increase in the last 10 years, 25,372. The number of white males is 131,899. Females, 137,511. And of free colored persons, 623. The number of white persons, deaf and dumb, is 136. And of blind, 117. How would it be being blind? Cassie and I talked of this, closing our eyes to affect the condition as we walked homeward today. For all that we stumbled, for all that we stumbled and clung to each other, clung each other, each of us knew and knew full well that we could open our eyes and see should we be choose, should we but choose to do so. Thus we determined tis not solely the condition, but whether or not one has a choice that determines its oppression. Hmm. Then how would it be to be colored a slave? I proposed it might compare with perfect obedience. But no, says Cassie, obedience is free for the more freely, for the more freely one submits, the better one obeys. <laughs> That's a good word. That was my personal <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> more than 600 free colored in New Hampshire. Hmm. More than 600 free colored in New Hampshire? I had not thought so many. With my phantom, should he be here still, there would be one more in number. In all of these United States, there are now 13 million people, some in each of the 28 states, but most in the eastern states of Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. 30 February 10th, 1831. Have not written in some days, being chilled and feverish by turns, the latter now abating. Neither have I attended school, but Cassie comes by daily, and I have well employed the time with penmanship and spelling. Maddie is eight years old today, a sweet and trusting child. I cannot but wish that mother might see her. M was so little when mother died, nor did she remember the infant boy whom we call Nathaniel, whose life was counted in days. Father rejoiced at his birth. Every farmer needs a son, and girls he already had. Twas funny to hear him talk to the infant, who lay all swaddled, and with no knowing of it, um, I'm sorry, and with no knowing of who it was that spoke to him, nor the words intention. I remember he talked to the child as if he were fully sensible. Once he promised he'd give to him, had indeed been saving for him the Barlow knife that he, our father, had had when he was but a boy. I must have, lo I must have looked quite startled at this, for Mother quickly interposed, but not till he is nearly a youth. Now, Charlie, don't be impatient for things that have to come, that have to come with time. I remember thinking this so well because soon after both sick, soon after both sickened and died, and then there was no more time. So basically she's talking about her mother having told her dad to be patient because, you know, the baby was a baby and now dad was promising uh, a knife that was once, that was his as a child to give to his firstborn son. Okay. 
Thursday, February 17th, 1831. Teacher Holt bought into school a copy of a newspaper, started this month in Boston by his Boston friend. Mr. Garrison intends that his paper, which he calls The Liberator, will quite largely concern itself with the slavery question. Quote, our country is the world, is its motto. Quote, our countrymen, all mankind. End quote. Teacher Holt read the motto very plainly and later set it out in chalk, we to copy it to our books and preserve it in our minds. Also, he bade us consider a poem. I was, it was printed in the newspaper, whose author stated he'd rather be enslaved than knowingly allow cruel chains to deprive another. I thought of Asa, whipped for the pies. I could not see, I could not see him where he sat, nor did he speak. Friday, February 18th, 1831. Cassie was not at school today, nor was Sophie Perkins. I and Asa and Maddie walked home, and all the while it was on my mind to speak my admiration for what A had done. Soon, too soon, we reached his gate, and I had not spoken. Me to be shy with Asa Shipman. He whom I've played with like a brother, and who indeed is to me a brother, and closer to me in some ways than he is to Cassie. Father was laid by much good cloth. Father has laid by much good cloth, which he's woven these winter months from yarn I spun last summer. Because of this and rebuilding the harrow, which suffers with our rocky soil, he has had to neglect the chair with its delicate spindles. Despite this, he plans a candle stand. We've been too long with no new things. A man, if he's not careful, finds that he has gotten stuck in his ways, who never meant to be so. Yes, a chair and a candle stand to stand by the north window there, with a cheery rug beside it. How would you like that, Catherine, my girl? But who will make the rug? Hmm. <laughs> Then off he went with some olden song with hums and words and whistles. He had, I think not, expected reply. What would he have had me to say? <laughs> Sunday, February 20th, 1831. Some of the district are solely distressed that Teacher Halt has brought Boston's news into the schoolhouse hours. <laughs> Reading, writing, and ciphering, they say, is all he's paid to know about and all he ought to teach. Behind this runs a darker rumor, one which strikes me with a dread I may not confess. Others had, it now appears, noted the footprints in Piper's Wood and, har and harbored their suspicions. Now they believe, putting all together, that Teacher Halt had been the one to help the runaway. How easily we could clear his name, but all of us fear to do so. Oh, there is no end to it. And though the phantom is long since gone, still does something of him remain. As alien it is, and unalterable as, no, no, no. As alien it is, and unalterable as the writing in my book and its plea now answered. Tuesday, February 22nd, 1831. Uncle Jack to visit. This is the first we've seen of him since the breaking out. He too has heard the buzzing rumors about our teacher Holt. Both he and father oppose slave holding, but have different ends in view. Father favors resettlement, which would be in Africa and a new formed nation. Uncle Jack says that freeman means free, as free as any man. But would you want that, Father persists, to have a black man as your neighbor? Or thinking he might expect 
a share in the town decisions? Please, miss, take pity. I am cold. Those were the words that were written in, in her journal. Okay. Wednesday, February 23rd, 9, uh, 1831. As if he would do it in the town's despite, Teacher Holt had brought Boston's news into the schoolhouse to consider an advertisement which had appeared in a southern newspaper. Mr. Garrison republished it to call smug Yankee attention to the nature of the offenses which the South condones. For sale, a black girl, 17 years of age, of excellent character and of good disposition, a very useful and handy person in a house for a turn of years, apply at the office of dot, dot, dot. 17 years is scarcely older than the oldest at school. Suppose that we had been made to be slaves rather than being born free. Would not a black girl know love and fear? Love and honor her father and mother and fear lest anything change? I had not considered the matter in this way before. The paper is dated the 5th of February. I wonder what befell her, where she may be now. Dialogue between youth, Christ, and the devil. Arise, awake, behold, thou hast thy life, a leaf, thy breath, a blast. At night lie down, prepared to have thy sleep, thy death, thy bed, thy grave. From our speller, page 36. Copy of letter submitted to the district meeting at our teach by our teacher, shown to me by Cassie Shipman, who had it from father, from her father, a town select man this year. Neighbors, friends, employers, two issues are before us as I am doubly accused. First, it is said that I have assisted an escaped Negro slave presumed to be to have been ref refuged in these our neighbor woods. Second, it is said that I have infringed upon my pupil's education by introducing in school hours texts other than school books, including newspapers. Concerning the first, my soul, only confession is that I, not, I have not done the thing of which I am accused. In this instance, I would probably accept that action's cons consequences. However, whatever, has, whatever his manner may suggest or his dreams encourage, your school teacher is no conspirator. Of that, you may be certain. Of the second complaint, I am guilty as charged and pledge that I will desist. Whatsoever I did, I did in good faith believing my offices as a teacher to include duties of moral education, that in a nation founded in freedom, the liberty of every man ought to be tested, assessed, and debated in every age and decade of that nation's life. To so engage your children is not, however, your choice, as I am here by your let and permission. I truly regret the dissatisfaction that has been occurred. Mindful of my obligations, I beg you, allow me, remain in good faith. Your obit servant, E. Ed, e. D. W. Holt. And that is the end of chapter 7.